We are live. All right. Good morning, everyone. Today is uh, April 19th, 2024, East Hampton Village Board Meeting. Thank you for attending. We have a few things on the agenda before we get to the reason everyone is here today. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet in the front. If you haven't signed up and you'd like to speak about the legislation proposal for the historic area, please sign up with uh, Gabby here in the front. Uh, before that, we're going to uh, please stand for the pledge. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, first up is our historian, Yu King. Hi, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for inviting all these people to be here. <laughs> okay, um, Luca 27, it's not the most important for a tour. Luca 27 is a group of individuals that after working all day, they go to class at night to improve their language skills. So they came to Home Sweet Home for a tour. They will be writing um, essays, and I will be getting copies of the essays for all of you to read, okay, at, probably at the next meeting. Also, the Girl Scouts came to Home Sweet Home, and they wrote a letter. Dear Mr. King, thank you so much for giving me and my Girl Scouts the tour of Home Sweet Home. It's a very interesting place. Also, thank you for telling us the story of the guy's big giant head. We have the uh, bust, the head of John Howard Payne in Home Sweet Home. Uh, came from uh, Prospect Park in Brooklyn. Uh, so we have that there. Remember, Payne was not born in the house, so don't keep telling that story, all right? Okay, we got the big head. Um, t going to tell anyone, oh yeah, we're not gonna tell anybody anyone about where you hid the keys. I mean the clock keys. When I got to Home Sweet Home, there's a banjo clock, and every day I would wind it up and put the key back inside the clock till somebody told me, don't do that. People not only collect clocks, they collect keys. So we hide the key someplace, and the kids say they're not going to tell anybody about it. Okay. I'm going to thank you for being kind, sweet, interesting, and fun, and Mystic Stick King deserves a raise. No, 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 no. They didn't say that. Didn't say that. Sorry. I really enjoyed it, and a bunch of people from the Girl Scouts told me they liked it too. Okay, and then they have some pictures, um, some pictures of the head, of the clock, uh, a dress that I showed them, and a teacup. Okay? Okay. And one final thing about the cemetery tour. I just want to report that um, Acting Chief Erickson did not show up to arrest Goody Garlic. Uh, Superintendent Collins did not show up to build the scaffold in case we had to have a hanging. And the village attorney, Lisa Perillo, did not show up to take uh, evidence. And we couldn't send the case to Connecticut because the judge, Terrell, Gerald Terzer, also didn't show up. See you next year. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is our police chief. Good morning. Um, today I have the uh, special honor uh, and privilege of adding one more to the ranks of the East Hampton Village Police Department. It's been over a year that we've had uh, a vacant uh, spot in the police department and uh, it's been a very, very arduous task with civil service regulations and training requirements to fill those. And we still have openings that uh, the village has supported us on and we're actively working to get our ranks up to the levels uh, that they are allotted. So this morning I have um, Officer uh, Nicholas Laval. Nicholas Laval started with us in 2018 as a TCO. As many have in the Village Police Department, it's kind of becomes a stepping stone. It's, it's really a privilege when one of our own is moving up, whether we've had dispatchers that moved to the level of police officer, or in this case, it's a traffic control officer that's been out there since 2018. He took his own time. He uh, started the academy in September uh, of last year on the 18th and graduated in March uh, the 21st on his own time going for 
uh, nights for four nights and all days on Saturdays. And he comes out with a certification the same as a, as a full-time, but he, he, did it, he did it on his own. And a, a testament to his dedication uh, for this job and for this community. So with that having said, I would like to again thank the board for their support in funding this position and bringing us to where it needs to be. And uh, I congratulate his parents are here, Kathy and Jason. If you could you just stand, I, uh, you know, uh, they are part of the puzzle too, the family. So I appreciate the dedication, uh, letting your son come to work uh, for the ranks of the East Hampton Village Police Department. And with that, I'd like to present Nicholas with your shield, uh, number 89. He has, will wear the badge of 89, so our 89th police officer um, in the village of East Hampton. If you want to come forward, I'll give you a man. All right, so next up is uh, Chris Hines for the uh, baseball field renovation in Herrick Park. Uh, good morning, Village East Hampton, and congratulations, Nicholas. Um, we're um, looking to do the renovation of the baseball field. I don't know if we had a picture of this or, okay, I mean, I, what's that? Okay. Uh, Come here. I don't have that one ready right now. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, and, and just with the baseball field renovation, what we're going to do is relocate the a base the baseball field into more of the corner where the, the sidewalks come to meet at the long-term parking lot and run along uh, Munchport Lane. Uh, we're going to renovate the side, continue the sidewalk renovation to bring it up from eight, make it eight foot all the way back to the overflow parking lot. So that'll allow you for uh, vehicle access, possible food trucks and various vent, um, various other access for your different events that you're gonna host there. The baseball field itself is gonna look very similar to the softball field. The, the backstops, dugouts are all gonna be constructed very similar. The big difference would be you're gonna have a 90 foot field versus a 60 foot field, which is for softball. Uh, the sidewalk's going to be renovated, ra rounded out, so it's going to make more of a um, more of a walking pattern. So everything. So once we complete this, it'll that's the area, the athletic portion of the park will be completed. Uh, we're anticipating sometime in the next two weeks to have temp fence up. Uh, once we have the award, we'll have the markouts done, and once those are done, we can start putting a shovel in the ground. So, and we anticipate being done by the. Memorial Weekend, if, give or take. It's terrific. Any, Any questions from the board? Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is Jerry Terza. It's our fire and ambulance coordinator. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the board. Uh, I don't know, Jason, do you guys have the video? Yes, yeah, Okay. So you'll all recall that uh, last year the village and not yet, not yet. Nope, not yet. It's okay. It's all good. Uh, so the village engaged the 929 uh, group 
uh, to produce a number of videos. Uh, they started out with one for the Beaches and the Lifeguard Program, which is very well received, very effective. Uh, so the village administrator, Mr. Belladron, decided, why don't we do something similar for fire and EMS to help bolster the ranks, uh, because it's becoming more and more difficult. So uh, back last fall, we had an opportunity to produce a video for the fire department, which we previewed at the, I believe, the December uh, board meeting. And that just left the EMS. And I was kind of going back and forth with a number of different production ideas. Uh, last month, we, an opportunity presented itself for us to put something together. And we're going to preview it here this morning. Uh, once this is uh, put before the board, uh, then we're going to be pushing it out. Uh, right now, the fire department one is on the village's website. We're going to try to push some more uh, social media. But the videos have been coming out great. And the EMS one in particular kind of uh, became very interesting because EMS is not typically looked at as being very glamorous. The fire department, we've got trucks, we've got fire, we've got flames. Uh, EMS, in order to really make a difference in someone's life, this is how you do it. Perfect. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so you'll see some, some folks in here uh, representing uh, new vitality. They're our youngest members. They're out there serving the public every single day. Uh, and it just kind of, this video kind of came together. Uh, it was the first time uh, we were able to use our EMS club that the uh, chief has, the new members of the EMS uh, volunteers, some of our more senior volunteers, as well as our paid staff in the fire department the first time we were ever able to mesh everything in, in one. Um, so, Jason, hold on. You could? One second, Jerry. Yep. I just want to say one thing. You go, you'll see in the video, you're going to see um, um, Chief Mott, Chief Mary Mott is in the video. She would have been here today, but unfortunately her husband suffered a very serious medical emergency the last couple of days, a couple of days ago, and um, he's doing well, but he's in Stony Brook Hospital right now, so he, uh, she couldn't make it here today. So we wish them well. After you. All right. Jason? I get in the back, I get a pair of gloves, and then you wait for whoever is going to get on, and then we respond. The Department of Emergency Medical Services under the EMS Chief implemented a program involving our youth in the high school. Students that may be interested in field EMS or science, you know, they've got the opportunity to come down here and learn from the ground up. We get monthly training during our department meetings, so I feel like they do a really good job of making sure that we're up to date on all of the new information that there is out there. We stay up to date with the trauma protocols, so they'll learn a skill or they'll learn a part of a piece that is needed in assessment so that they have the opportunity to engage with a situation that's not just you know textbook driven or a writing assignment that now they have the tools and the information so that they can go on a practice ambulance call knowing what is they're looking at, you know, how do they recognize what they need to do, and then how can they go ahead and do it. The Village of East Hampton is certainly committed to ensuring that our responders have the best resources possible, whether that's material and equipment uh, or personnel and training, to be able to provide the best pre-hospital care to the public as possible. All the people here are really helpful too, you know, everybody's always looking out for each other and asking if you're okay or you, you know, you need anything, people are always willing to help. And there's also many mental health resources available. In the run room we have a hotline that's always available for us. It is very rewarding. It teaches you a lot of skills like working with new people, working as a team, and just how to talk to people as well. You get tremendous personal growth, you feel great about engaging with your community, you feel proud of what you're doing. When you think, what can I do to help my community that would have such a positive impact on people's lives, EMS is the place where you want to start. And we would just like to thank the board for their support in these, uh, in these projects. So we have the sign-up list right over here, if anybody would like to join. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jerry.
All right, so um, next up, we're going to move into this public hearing, which is probably, probably why most of you are here. Before we get started, I would just like to introduce people sitting on the stage. All the way to the right is Ms. McKay. She is uh, the uh, mayor's secretary. Uh, next is our village attorney, Lisa Perillo. Next to me is trustee uh, Sarah um, Amadon. To my left is trustee Sandra Melendez. And to my far left is village administrator Marcos Balladon. So just so you know, if, as people talk, you'll know who's talking and it's kind of uh, important. So what I'd like to do is we're going to open this up. If you could read the, uh, before we read the law, I'd just like to say this is about our historic street, our historic district on Main Street. This does not affect any other areas within the village. It is only the historic district on Main Street, which is basically encompasses the five inns that have restaurants. So we found it important because these inns are pre-existing, non-conforming, which means they've been around here before code was even uh, created. And we thought it was important that we put a curfew or a limit on the hours that can be these restaurants can operate. So that's what this proposal is here today in front of you. We, the village board, it's our job to provide safety and health to our residents. It's also our job to make sure people's quality of life is looked after. And all of these restaurants are in residential areas. So we don't think it's necessary for that type of establishment to be open until two, three, four o'clock in the morning. So that's what this is all about. Without any further ado, I'll have the, uh, the proposed legislation read, and then we'll start taking comments. Introductory number 13 of 2024. Can't hear. Introductory number 13 of 2024, a proposed local law amending Chapter 176, Historic Areas, the Preservation of. Okay. Uh, Gabby, who's on the first? Uh, First speaker, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, Martha? I'm gonna let my partner, Chris Kelly, go first. Mr. Kelly? Just for the record, uh, just say this once. Uh, when, you approach, when you get to the podium, please state your name and who you represent, or in the case of an attorney. And I would ask, since this is a very controversial thing, that if somebody's not saying what you want to hear, please be respectful of that person and you, you'll have your opportunity to speak as well. Uh, we also are limiting three minute comments. Three minutes. Three minutes. Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the board, my name is Christopher Kelly from Toomey, Latham, Shea, Kelly, Dubin, and Cordoraro. Uh, I'm here representing the owners of the Hedges Inn, the Hedges Inn LLC, and the Hedges in Management Company, LLC, as well as St. Luke's Church. I'm here today to oppose the adoption of the proposed amendments to Chapter 176, Historical Preservation, as they relate to opening uh, operating hours of so-called eating and drinking establishments. I'll reserve any rebuttal to the mayor's comments in the paper from yesterday, um, believing that in time he may decide to make an apology, but at least he would research how the owners of the Hedges Inn got to be owners, uh, and how long they've been owners, and why they became owners. Um, I also note that we submitted a letter of comment uh, dated April 17th, which we received earlier this week, and those comments were based on the law as it was noticed in the Notice of Public Hearing and published. I've since found out, as of last night, that a different law has now been distributed to you with changes in your agenda packets. My comments of the April 17th letter dealt with the initial law as noticed, but my comments there and the comments today um, most all relate to the new uh, revision as well. It appears that this is a proposal that is a, a solution in search of a problem. There's been no record made of any sort of rowdy behavior, noise, disruption of the historic districts to date. Uh, in fact, the inns all have a reason not to allow that to happen because they all have borders. Um, they rent rooms. Uh, 
the target of this legislation, based on the comments of the mayor in the newspaper, appear to be rumors that one or more of the inns, including the Hedges Inn, may lease or sell to a, a supper club for their restaurant uh, accessory uses. But without a record of a problem, the amendment can't be analyzed to see if it has a reasonable basis for enactment to protect public health and safety, something the Court of Appeals has said is an absolute necessity. In fact, the Court of Appeals in one case where it invalidated this type of legislation said, quote, you can't use a cannon to kill a butterfly. Now, as I mentioned in the letter, the, the basic objection legally is that this is ultra virus, that the village doesn't have the power, the police powers to enact this type of legislation, and it's thus unconstitutional. The problem is that the Court of Appeals in two cases, and subsequently the Attorney General's office has opined, that state law regarding alcohol, uh, the Alcohol Beverage Control Act, completely preempts the regulation of operating hours of any establishment that sells alcohol. It's the Attorney General has gone as far to say that a convenience store or a pizza parlor's hours can't be regulated by a municipality. The village of Clinton upstate tried to do that and limit the hours from between um, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. to being uh, closed for business. And the AG said you can't do that because pizza parlors and convenience stores can sell beer. But the AG also said that unless you really show that uh, there is a, um, that the business is being conducted in an unreasonable manner, you can't use regulation as a guise uh, for promoting the general welfare. It cannot be justified as an exercise of police power. And that's where the quote about the cannon and the butterfly comes from in the original R. Tyson Inc. case versus Tyler. The other problem with this law legally is it's a, it appears to be an attempt to exercise uh, powers that are really uh, defined in the zoning code without the limitations of a zoning amendment. Mr. Kelly, time. Uh, I'll reserve my time to come back after. I think there's only three people on the list, but I would ask the opportunity to uh, finish my remarks at the end. Thank you. Martha, did you want to speak? Hello, members of the board. My name is Martha Reichert. To me, Latham Shea, Kelly Dubin, and Quartararo, 33 West 2nd Street, Riverhead, New York. I'm here on behalf of two of the inns, uh, the Hunting Inn and the Maidstone Hotel, to provide certain comments on this proposed legislation. I've reviewed the amended version that appears in the agenda packet as well. And, you know, I, I come here to make these comments in the context of having been a formal municipal attorney, um, someone with a background in historic preservation, and also uh, someone with also a practical knowledge of running a restaurant. Um, and so when I spoke with my clients and presented this legislation with them, they had concerns about how it practically will affect their operations. And I think that that's something that this village should take into consideration. Um, this current draft needs to be reviewed more closely um, with respect to practical guidance in terms of you know, what does open for business mean in the context of an inn? Uh, you know, the traditional definition of an inn, and I'm gonna read from dictionary.com, is a commercial establishment that provides lodging, food, et cetera, for the public, especially travelers, a small hotel. And in that case, the village code already recognizes that where an inn starts and the restaurant ends is difficult to, to establish. In fact, section 2016B of the code says it is also the express intent of this chapter that a bar and restaurant uses shall be treated as customary accessory uses for an inn. And so when you look at the way this law is crafted, um, again, how does it practically operate? The penalties are very, very harsh for a violation. So conversely, where the village seeks to really, um, as it states, abate a public nuisance, compliance should be very clear as well. Um, and so we ask that the village go back to the drawing table and really take a hard look at, have they crafted a law that can be complied with. The other thing is to sort of recognize the nature of the hospitality industry, and especially an inn. 
Um, it's one thing when outside diners are dining at the inn's restaurant, but it's a different case when you're dealing with the hotel guests. Um, the way this law is crafted, it prohibits room service after a certain time. It also prohibits, you know, by my reading of it, a mini bar, a self-service station. So if someone comes down from their room in the middle of the night and they want a bottle of water and there's a tray with water, right? This already says that you can't give food or beverage to anyone. So a snack bar, any self-service, room service would be prohibited under this law. And I think that really has a chilling effect on the way these businesses can operate, the services they can provide. The stated legislative intent of this law right now is to deal with noise and traffic issues. As my colleague, Mr. Kelly, has stated, you know, I think the village needs to study how, how deep this problem is, but also the unintended consequences of not making room for an inn to provide food and beverages to its patrons whenever they may need it, which is we live in an era of Uber Eats, DoorDash, et cetera. So what you could potentially be doing is seeing a proliferation of deliveries to these inns after hours, whereas before they could have just gotten a snack or a beverage internally, um, calling an Uber to go to a convenience store to get it. Um, so I think that... Time. Time is up. I just have a question. Uh, you said you represent two of the inns? Yes, the Which Hunting ones? Inn and the Maidstone Hotel. Okay, so are you for the legislation or against, or you need it, you think it needs to be tweaked just to cover those ends? I think at this point it needs to be tweaked and given a certain careful consideration. I think one of my recommendations is why not gather, I mean that's the purpose of this public hearing is to gather input, but why not craft it with people who are actually running ends, you know, members of the community who feel affected and, and make it a true right. well-crafted piece of legislation. No, thank you, thank you for clarifying. And I just want to be clear, we are not closing this hearing. We're going to keep this hearing open for at least another month so that more residents can find out about this and can be heard. So we are going to take all these comments into consideration, and we will have our attorney uh, tweak the law, if you will, if it needs to be. So we will be doing exactly what you're saying. If I could just finish my one last comment and recommendation, it would be to, again, not only make it something that can be practically complied with, but also to create consistency with the noise ordinance, the other sections of the code, and um, to con contemplate exceptions for New Year's Eve, certain holidays, special events, weddings, et cetera, to Thank provide you. flexibility Gosh, in the law. Thank you very much. Mr. Lipper. Good morning. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the mayor and uh, Trustee Abedin uh, for standing up for the health and safety of the village. Uh, I'm a village, I've had a home here with my family for 50 years, and I happen to be about 30 yards behind the Hedges Inn on Hook Pond Lane. Uh, the, uh, I've heard what the esteemed attorney said, uh, however he's wrong, as former Deputy Mayor of New York and a Commissioner of the Port Authority, it is the duty, not only the right, but the duty of public officials to protect the health and safety of their community. And that is embedded as the main purpose for local government. So I challenge on a legal basis uh, what was said earlier. Uh, this is an important matter precipitated by the conversion of uh, the hedges. Uh, to the Zero Club. We know the people that were mentioned who are members of it never travel alone. They have an entourage of hangers-on, drivers, bodyguards, and of course the ever-present paparazzi, which gives oxygen to that whole club. That will change the very character of the village. It will change the safety and health because the entire length of Hook Pond, instead of being inhabited by swans, will be inhabited by these groups of people who make a permanent encampment. Not quite the homeless, because they're paid, but uh, it, it will be an encampment on Hook Pond, a permanent encampment. That will offend the rights of every person in the village, and these people don't arrive by taking the jitney. 
they come in with their private jets. And the way the airport is currently unregulated, uh, these jets can come and go at will. And I think we should speak to Kathy Burke Gonzalez, our supervisor, uh, about regulating when these planes can land and take off. Because it is not inconceivable that these planes will be taking off at three in the morning, four in the morning, and disturbing not only the village residents, but the entire uh, town of East Hampton. We were voted the most beautiful village in the United States a few years ago. And I think it's the duty of our government to maintain the character that has prevailed here for almost 400 years. And, uh, and so it's not only your right, but your duty to do so. I will join you as an amicus curiae in defending this legislation uh, uh, if it's challenged in court. Thank you. Rick Whalen. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the board. Richard Whalen from Whalen Filer PLLC. Uh, I represent neighbors on James Lane who are uh, neighbors of the Hedges Inn, very close to the Hedges Inn. Uh, we are in support of the legislation. Uh, we commend the village trustees for bringing this forth. It's something that, uh, in light of you know, what seems to be developing, something that is needed. Uh, we think that the village has the, both the power and the responsibility uh, to regulate uh, the hours of operation for, for restaurants in, in this nature. They're, these are restaurants that are not only uh, in the village historic district, but they're also, uh, I believe all of them are in uh, zone, residential, residentially zoned. So we think you have the power to do this. We support it. Um, I do want to add that I mean, the concern, I think, at least from my client's point of view, obviously is not so much what goes on inside the restaurant, but um, as the prior speaker indicated, there's a lot, of, a lot that goes along with keeping a club or a, a nightclub or a restaurant, we won't call it a nightclub here, open into late hours. And that's primarily traffic and the noise and commotion that's generated with people coming and going in the early morning hours, and again, all in residential zones. So uh, we very much support the legislation. If you, you know, make changes or adjustments to it, you know, we'll be back to, to deal with those. But we, uh, we thank you for being proactive in this matter. Thank you. Mr. Gantz. Good afternoon. Um, you know, I, I just have a, a few comments. The first thing is, we are not the most beautiful village. We've never been voted the most beautiful village. We're a beautiful village, but not the most. All right, so I just want to straighten that out because it's really, we're making Let's false statements. On the hearing, Mr. Uh, I am, but, uh, but uh, I'm refuting what was just said before. I don't think this, I think we should all look at what the elephant in the room is. The elephant in the room is, is having a private club or membership club. And I looked at the law about historical districts and there appears to be nothing wrong with having a private club there, all right? And in terms of these, I think this was generated just to prevent this, all right? Six months ago, you, we wouldn't give that any, any, um, any solace whatsoever. But now, all of a sudden, oh, we can't have a private club. It's not, and it's, also, it's not a question of protecting the people. It's anticipating the people that are, are going to be there. And as long as there's enforcement, I don't see a problem. And, and I, I welcome the, the carpetbaggers, you know, basically coming into town, because you, we've done a lot of things without having a, a, a political uh, discourse in, in open meetings. We've, we've done, done the Tesla Stadium. I mean, there are precedents set. But would you like my, my minute and 35 seconds? Go ahead. One thing that I wanted to mention here is that the, one of the problems with the legislation is the overbroad definition of what an eating and drinking establishment is, and also the vagueness of what being closed for business is. And based on a, a reading of the proposal, I've prepared a, a list of anomalies and unintended consequences, which we know laws always have, 
but that are particularly absurd based on the way the law is written, and I'd like to distribute that. This very broad net that's been cast by the legislation as it's been drafted, rather imprecisely I'd say, is that not-for-profits throughout the, uh, the historic districts, and by the way, just a correction, I believe that this applies the way it's written to all historic districts, not just the Main Street historic district. No inn can have a New Year's Eve party where a patron stays past 11 p.m. or where a drink or dessert is ordered after 10 p.m. St. Luke's rector and acolytes can be jailed for serving communion at Christmas Eve midnight mass. Patrons who linger at their tables after dinner on a July Saturday night cannot order a cup of coffee, a sparkling water, or a brandy after 10. I reserve my time. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we had on the list. Is there anybody who would like to speak? Please come on up uh, one at a time, obviously. And just state your name. If you didn't get a chance to sign up, you can certainly speak. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Cunningham. I'm the executive director of the Village Preservation Society of East Hampton. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'd like to read this letter into the record and I'll submit it for your files. Um, Dear Mayor Larson and the Board of Trustees, the trustees of the Village Preservation Society of East Hampton, excluding John L. McGurk III and Joseph B. Rose, both of whom are recused from the organization's positions and deliberations on this matter, right to support the regulation of non-conforming uses in residence districts as well as the historic districts of the village. Ample justification to regulate non-conforming uses so as to mitigate their impact on residential neighborhoods can be found in the comprehensive plan. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, please see the information at this link. I've printed it out. It's the um, Department of State has a piece on legal memorandum regarding hours of operation and what the what municipalities can do. Chapter 278, zoning, defines non-conforming uses and the applicable procedures for review. While a, a special permit is required for the extension, expansion, or alteration of a non-conforming use, prohibited uses are subject to more rigorous requirements of a use variance. A proposal as described in the East Hampton Star to house a members only club with after hours operations will intensify the pre-existing non-conforming use at the Hedges Inn and several other similar establishments which are residentially zoned. The fact that these establishments are located in the Main Street Historic District warrants additional concern. Village residents place a high value on the historic nature of this community and the quality of life and peaceful enjoyment of home and property that they enjoy. Permitting a nightclub or similar atmosphere operating into morning hours is an intensification of the use and is a disruption to the surrounding residential neighborhood. Such use challenges the essential use of the building as a restaurant, tavern, or place of lodging as well as adversely impacting the Main Street Historic District. We generally support the operation of restaurants and taverns that are pre-existing non-conforming as long as they do not impose on the rights of neighboring residents to their peaceful enjoyment of home and property. Permitting after hours usages such as a members only club will put an additional burden on neighboring residents as well as intensify the pre-existing non-conforming use while degrading a meaningful historic property in the Main Street Historic District. With a large village-wide deficit of parking and serious traffic congestion all summer long, not to mention the extended shelter seasons, ensuring that village residents are spared the late night traffic and the comings and goings and after hour clubs of this sort is essential. We applaud the board's plans to address these concerns. We re recommend a moratorium on such uses. Can you give me 10 seconds? I really just have one more sentence. We recommend a moratorium on such uses pending further study to clarify, clearly define the parameters of the problem and further suggest prohibiting such uses as the most effective means of control. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Who hasn't? Sir? Or oh, not? Behind you. Sorry. Good morning. Thank you for listening to us today. Uh, I'm, my name is Marty Cohen. I'm the chairman of the board of Guild Hall. The Guild Hall, as you know, is a cultural center of East Hampton. We are celebrating our 93rd year on Main Street and have gone under, are undergoing a, a major renovation to improve the visitor experience and to serve the community uh, all the more. My only thought is, why 10 o'clock? Everything closes down at 11. We have uh, performances, whether it's film or, or, or music, whatever, uh, and we often have a reception afterwards in our garden. Uh, based on how I read this, unless I, something has changed, we would be prohibited from doing that. Also, there are people who might want to, uh, performance ends at nine and they want to go across the street to a, you know, an inn for dinner. Uh, that would be pr pretty much prohibitive. So I think, why 10 o'clock? 11 o'clock has been working fabulously and to change the rules for the entire neighborhood uh, because of one uh, 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 inn that might be doing something that's objectionable, I think everyone who's going to, every, everyone else is going to suffer from that, I think unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Chris. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Thank you for uh, letting me continue my presentation. Um, yeah, the next item on my list, by the way, was the fact that Guild Hall couldn't serve a, a glass of wine, white wine or club soda to a member at a post-performance reception in their garden patio after 10 p.m. The other end. regulations is, is the 6 a.m. start time, which would prevent any of the inns from putting out coffee or muffins for somebody who might. If it's easier, you can take that mic out of that thing. Be like Phil Donahue when I walk around. Yeah, walk around. <laughs> uh, the, uh, would prevent an inn from putting out coffee or muffins for somebody who had to get on an early jitney if they had to leave by 6 a.m. Um, wedding receptions, which are conducted at St. Luke's Church in the parish hall um, and at the Historical Society property for, of Mulford Farm, would have to close their doors, as, and uh, Mulford Farm is obviously closing doors is a little problematic, but clear their property of patrons because the definition of closed for business is not well defined, it's too broad, and it, this law covers all not-for-profits who sell or give food because it talks of clubs and organizations. Um, the real problem here is what is closed for business for an inn? If we're renting rooms, if any of the inns are renting rooms, does that mean at 11 o'clock we have to send a manager up to the rooms and wake people up and say, you have to get out of your bed and leave, but you can come back at 6 a.m.? It sounds absurd, but that's the way the law is written. So we ask you to address that and all these anomalies uh, which make this law invalid. My partner mentioned that there's, uh, this would prevent room service. You couldn't get up and have a snack between 10 a.m., excuse me, 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Um, so we asked the board to, to, to reject this type of legislation. I think my, my friend Kathy Cunningham proved the point here that this is, in essence, an attempt at a zoning uh, amendment. And as a zoning amendment, it needs to go through CEQA. It needs to be shown to be in compliance with a comprehensive plan. And in this case, it has to be referred to the Suffolk County Planning Commission. None of that has happened. But this is the same situation that the uh, village got into when we had to sue them last time over the amendments to the special event legislation. And as you are all aware, the court invalidated that, finding it was in essence a zoning amendment and that properties of uh, similarly situated in the same zoning district could not be treated differently. You cannot make separate rules for it. And by the way, that points up another thing. Every residence in the historic district can party without limitation. 
Thank you, and I urge your rejection of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, last, uh, last chance, if anybody would like to comment. Thank you. Uh, Martha Reichert again for the Hunting Inn and the Maidstone Hotel. Um, I want to continue just sort of the, the idea that, you know, well-crafted legislation has a well-stated legislative intent, which this has. Um, it's always great when you cite to your statutory authority for what you're trying to regulate, but also to have clear and concise terms. And I think that, again, going back to the idea of what open or closed for business means in the context of the inns and their restaurants, needs to be parsed out more. Um, it's clearer when you're dealing with, say, a standalone cafe, right? But where you have something that's accessory to that use, especially where it's, you know, a hotel or an inn, right, which is a temporary residence, it becomes less clear. But again, just to even bring it back to the restaurant use, what does open and close for business mean? Because while you may not be serving patrons anymore, anyone who's worked in a restaurant knows that open for business, you know, could technically cover the time when your employees show up and they start cleaning, baking early in the morning, or after there's no longer food service or beverage service, clean up, et cetera. And so again, if you want the inns to be able to comply in good faith, you have to give clear terms. And so I just want to keep bringing that home again in this legislation is that um, it needs to be something that works logistically. And so again, I would advise consulting with you know, the ins and their operators to understand. Again, you know, and just one other thing I want to, to point out in terms of, you know, if you physically go and visit a lot of the inns, you'll see that, again, that in use and that restaurant use are physically uh, intertwined. At the Maidstone Hotel, there are several rooms that can only be accessed through the dining room, right? So again, how does this law affect people getting to their rooms and what open and close for business means? Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going I'm sorry, Mr. Lee. just step up because this is live and I'm sure there's a lot of people watching this. We've heard a lot of uh, statements about this might not work, that might not work. Uh, this detail hasn't been attended to in the legislation. Most legislation of this type is followed by regulations. Normal legislation doesn't cover every contingency, every point. Normally there is a series of regulations that are implemented by the administration in the village to take into account various things like that that come up as to whether you can clean or not clean, whether you can have a refrigerator in the room or not have a refrigerator in the room. So that's an incremental process that comes after the general legislation is passed. That goes for Congress, that goes for city councils, that goes for village councils. It's a uniform practice in a democracy. Thank you. Thank you. David. Just so, two comments. Up until probably 15 years ago, there was a place called James Lane Cafe, which was basically a palm there that was there probably maybe 10, 15 years. And it was open way past, not way past, but it was open past 10 p.m. So I just, just want to raise that point. Because there was an existing restaurant, not private, but it was a restaurant. Yeah, I'm aware of that. And I believe the, Cum the uh, Cummings family bought it because they didn't want to deal with the noise. So thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Courtney Garneau, and I'm a member of this community, and I think we can talk about the legalese and all of that, but what really we're, we're talking about is community. And I believe when the Cumming family came in and renovated the historic Hedges Inn that has been part of our town for 300 years, that was their intention. Perhaps their intention has changed, and I think what we're all here as a community concerned about is that the potential lease of this property to an exclusive club 
That's not what East Hampton is about. We're not about, yes, we are a playground for the rich, but we're not in our historic district. Um, I, think, I think it's ridiculous for us to consider making that privatization. When the hedges was renovated in two, 2016, and when Bar None became an operating restaurant for the public, the Hedges Inn became a place for our local kids to work, for our local families to enjoy. And, I mean, and if anyone's been there, I mean, it's an idyllic place in East Hampton Village. And it's something that we can talk laws and regulations about, but I think what it boils down to is the community of East Hampton. And that is something that we all need to preserve, especially as we continue on and watch our local community grow with gigantic houses, grow with natural resources being impeded. I mean, there's so many different levels of adding this private um, entity to our local small community. It, it just doesn't work. And I think we're all here to preserve that because that's why we all live here and what we want for our community. And I um, applaud the board for trying for, you know, to, to bring up some reasons to sort of slow this process down. And I think we need more community and more time and more people to show up and say, this is, this is what we want. And this is what we want to preserve. And this is what we have to do. Thank you. Very well said, very well. All right, we're going to keep the hearing open. We're going to take everything that you've all said, and I think the law can be tweaked to help all the situations that we're talking about. But at the end of the day, this law will stop late night noise. We're not going to put up with that. It's not going to happen. And if we need to go to court and fight about it, then that's where this will end up going. But we will come up with a, a law that will satisfy most people unless you want to operate late at night. And that's not going to happen in our historic districts or our residential areas. It just cannot happen. So thank you very much for everybody. Yeah, so the people that couldn't be here today have uh, sent emails to me, uh, phone calls, and so we're going to keep this open at least for another month so that the Star and the, and the press have an opportunity to put more uh, stories out and we get more village residents engaged in this conversation. And hopefully next month, we'll come back with something that will resolve the, uh, the situation for St. Luke's and the situation for Guild Hall and the situation for um, the Historical Society. And, and I think, again, at the end of the day, it's just gonna be about late night operations, which cannot happen. So thank you all for coming. I know it's a lot to get out here. So thank you very much. All right, we're going to take, just take a five minute break, Jason, so we can let people um, leave. We're not going to vote on anything today, so if you don't want to stay for the rest of the meeting, please feel free to leave. Chris?
And we are live. We're live? Yep. Uh, great. Maybe you can back up a second or so. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, so we're up for introductory number four, 2024. Ms. McKay, if you yes. could read the legislation. A proposed local law amending Chapter 278, Zoning, Section 278.1, Definitions, Nonconforming Buildings, and two seven, Sections 278.3, Accessory Building and Structure Design Requirements and Wetland Setbacks, and Section 278.3, A, Wetland Setbacks. Is there anyone who would like to be heard? Anyone from the board? Okay, can I get a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Second. Hearing's closed. Introductory number 10 of 2024, a proposed local law amending section 278.7, Board of Appeals, Variances, Special Permits, Fees. Anyone from the public would like to be heard? Board? Motion to close? So moved. Hearing's closed. Introductory number 11 of 2024, a proposed local law amending Chapter 256, Article 5, partial exemption for members of Voluntary Fire Department and Voluntary Ambulance Service, Section 256.7, exemption granted, amount eligibility, Section 256.8, life extension of exemption, Section 256.9, application for exemption, and adding Section 256.9, a effective date. Anyone from the public like to be heard? Board? Motion to close. So moved. Hearing is closed. Introductory number 12 of 2024, a proposed local law amending Chapter 267.5C4. Beach parking permits, monthly parking permits shall be issued rather than half season parking permits. Anyone from the public? Board? Motion to close. So moved. Hearing is closed. All right, next up is for board discussion. Mr. Hajak is going to talk to us about the Cove Hollow Georgia Capond pipe. Co Cove Hollow pipe. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, members of the board. Um, Billy Hajak for the village, along with Maria Olson, who's a landscape architect with VHB. They're the engineering firm that was selected uh, to design the project. This is one of multiple stormwater um, prevention projects that is ongoing within the Georgica Pond watershed. Um, and it's the constructed wetland at the terminus of Cove Hollow Road or the Cove Hollow Road pipe. Um, so I'll go through this very quickly for you. It's been a long meeting. Um, just a little bit of background is the pipe was constructed in the 1930s. Interestingly, it was uh, started as a CCC project um, during the Great Depression under President Roosevelt's New Deal program. Um, so it's a s over 7,000 linear foot long pipe uh, that stretches from roughly Route 114 um, and it ends at the terminus at Cove Hollow Road. Um, so all stormwater runoff that's generated within that vicinity for the most part is all directed into the pipe uh, by a series of catch basins um, and all that stormwater is flushed down into the Georgica Cove section of Georgica Pond. Um, that area is experiencing excessive algal blooms um, there's usually, that's attributed to an ex excess of nitrogen and phosphorus and testing that's been conducted by Surfrider and the Friends of Georgica Fond Pond have also found high fecal coliform counts um, at the area of the pipe. So we, we believe that's all attributed to the stormwater uh, that's being directed into the pond. Um, <clears throat> so at this project started in 2017 um, by the village. Uh, and it's been funded through the Community Preservation Fund Water Quality Initiative. Um, I won't go through all the conditions that we found, but it, this project started by scoping the, scoping the whole entire pipe. Uh, Drew Bennett actually did the initial investigation. Um, interestingly, he had plans from when the pipe was installed because his dad worked for Suffolk County in like the 60s and 70s, <laughs> which is pretty, pretty amazing that he had them in his basement. <laughs> um, so, and I provided you with a, you know, an outline of the conditions that were found uh, during the pipe scoping. Uh, there's a couple of aerial photographs that are included in your packet. Uh, one of them also shows the topographic conditions in the area of the site, which shows that all the water is flowing in the direction of, you know, this road end. 
Um, and then there's a map in here that was put together by Eastern Environmental, shows the length of the pipe, shows all the inlets, um, identifies all the, the troubled spots which we're working on addressing um, in connection with this end of pipe treatment program. Uh, and then there's a photograph which shows what the internal conditions of the pipe look like. They actually drove an ROV vehicle through there and took photographs and video. Um, we found utilities crossing it. We found uh, people had basically pried, pried the pipe open and are directing stormwater runoff from their own properties into it. There's a, there's a series of issues that are, that are going on there. And that's all identified in the observation of deficiencies uh, section of the presentation, which I, I won't get into uh, too much of the detail of it. And then uh, it's pro provided you with a couple of photographs showing uh, the, the area in question, a view from Georgica Road. Uh, there's the terminus, um, <clears throat> there's a view from the pond, and then also the actual pipe and the outfall box, uh, which is where the stormwater eventually makes its way into uh, Georgica Pond, the Georgica Cove section of the pond. Um, you'll see the, the box there as the outfall area, and then it's surrounded by wetlands and Phragmites. Uh, so <clears throat> the engineers who worked on this and the landscape architects have recommended a series of fixes. Some of those are actually occurring right now with the New York State conducting improvements to the right-of-way and the drainage system that exists right now in the state right-of-way, which is a good thing. And this work actually led to some of their correction uh, that, that's ongoing. So th this is very good. And then the, the main point here is the end of pipe treatment. Um, and the last page here uh, shows the, the latest design, which is purely just keeping, putting the road back essentially as it exists right now, um, just making it more of a, a true uh, cul-de-sac at the end for emergency vehicle turnaround, um, keeping the road exactly the same, keeping the grass on the, would be the west side as it currently exists, and installing what are a series of micro pools where the water is going to be diverted into these micro pools. The pools will be planted with native vegetation. That vegetation will uh, treat the water and this way the stormwater isn't directed directly into the cove anymore. It's very similar in design to what was done on the Methodist Lane bioswale. Yeah, that's, that's and, very nice. Yep, it'll look pretty similar. It's similar types of species, a lot of grasses, a lot of herbaceous plants. Um, it'll, it'll look very, very nice. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so we, the village did receive support from the Friends of Georgia Capon for this. Um, the project is in the permitting stage with the DEC, the Army Corps of Engineers, um, and the Department of State, and we're awaiting their comments, eagerly awaiting their comments. Uh, later on on your um, agenda here, we, I prepared a CEQRA determination for you to make a negative declaration, and when you do that, we can send it off to the agencies that are going to be approving this. Um, and again, as I indicated before, it's um, being funded by the Community Preservation Program uh, Water Quality Initiatives. And when time comes for, to actually construct it, uh, we'll probably go out and try to pursue funding from other sources, including the state and the county. So if you have any specific questions for me, um, I can answer them. Maria's here also to answer the technical stuff that I can't deal with. Looks very clear to me. Great. Good. No, it looks Visual good. Good, 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 good. Looks better than what we originally had on there. Yeah, yeah, we've paired it. We've really back. toned it. We've toned it down um, and paired it back, and it's really just a now. It's just a water quality yeah, improvement it project. Like a, it looked like a state park. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's it's actually perfect. Yeah. Good, good. Looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. What do we have next? Oh, uh, we're going to talk about more legislation, proposed legislation. If the the board agrees, we'll move it for a public hearing. If you could read it for us, Ms. McKay. Okay. Um, chapter 176 of the Code of the Village of East Hampton. Um, late night, section 17611, late night restaurant clubs are prohibited in the historic districts. For purposes of this section, a late night restaurant club is defined as A, a membership or subscription based social dining and beverage venue establishment or association whose membership pays for said membership by dues, subscription, donation, or a membership fee, and B, which operates between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. A late night restaurant club may include any restaurant, nightclub, cabaret, tavern, bar, cafe, hotel, motel, inn, supper club, or social club, or any other facility, venue, accommodation, or establishment 
that is owned, leased, licensed, managed, or otherwise operated in whole or in part as a late night restaurant club and whose facilities, use of space, meals, beverages, or services are limited or reserved in whole or in part to the late night restaurant club. That's terrific. So I'll start with the, uh, my comments about this. So we've all heard the rumors and it was very clear today that there's a big fight to start bringing these late night clubs to our area. Um, I think the board has a duty to protect the residents who live in these areas against this type of late night disruptions. When I served as police chief for 14 years, there were always restaurants that came into town that decided they wanted to do late night entertainment, late night partying, and we used all the tools at our disposal. Uh, New York State Department of Transportation, we en enacted no stopping zones because in one particular case we had limos and um, it was actually very dangerous because it was right on Montauk Highway. People were in and out of cars, obviously drinking. And we used the State Liquor Authority to help us. We used fire codes, overcrowding codes, building codes, uh, blocking fire exit codes. So there's a lot of tools at the, at the current police chief's disposal, but I think it's our responsibility to give him some more uh, tools that he can use to keep these places under control or even better out of our historic districts. So that's what this is all about. If the board agrees, we could agree to move it to a public hearing for our next board meeting. Everybody's in favor, so we're going to move that for a public hearing. All right. Let's, uh, is there any public comment before we move into resolutions? All right, so we're gonna, now we're going to move into resolutions. Resolution number 273 of 2024, approved claim vouchers for the month of April. So moved. Second. All in favor? Passing carry. Resolution number 274, approve warrants as listed. Number 44, guarantees. Number 45 and 46, general fund. Number 47, general fund warrant. Number 48, capital fund. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Aye. Resolution number 275, approve budget transfer schedule number six, reference number six, dated April of 2024. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 276, approve minutes from the Board of Trustees meeting held on December 15th of 2023. So moved. Passed and carried. Number 277, approve departmental reports. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 278, resolve the 2023-2024 village budget is hereby amended to increase estimated revenue and appropriations in the amount of $101,329 for expenditures related to paving restorations. So moved. Passed and carried. Number 279, approve the Village Ma Mayor's Monarch Butterf Butterfly Pledge. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 280, approve $15,900.80 quote for communication upgrades at the Emergency Services Building, 1 Cedar Street from New Era Technology. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 281, approve $10,598 quote for one-year camera licenses from Howard Technology Solutions per Suffolk County contract. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 282, approve $29,030 quote from Herrick Park Camera Upgrades from Howard, Te Howard Technology Solutions per Suffolk County contract to be paid from the assigned unappropriated fund balance. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 283, approve $47,821.28 quote from Radar Signs from All Traffic Solutions to be paid from the assigned unappropriated fund balance. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 284, approve $2,000 quote for one year of ATS Traffic Cloud subscription from All Traffic Solutions. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 285, approve the fee for non-resident monthly beach parking permits for June at $250 each, July at $300 each, and August at $300 each, effective May 1st, 2024. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. 
Number 286, approve the five-year software agreement with IPS Group. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 287, approve the $8,010 quote from Derrick and Crawford Landscape Architects for Herrick Park. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 288, approve $6,607.25 quote from Logo Matt Central for the Emergency Services Building at 1 Cedar Street. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 289, approved design of new Herrick Park baseball field. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 290, approve adoption of negative secret declaration regarding Herrick Park baseball field. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 291, approve the agreement between the Incorporated Village of East Hampton and the Lantec Group Incorporated for the renovation of the Herrick Park baseball field and related site improvements at a cost of $535,720.60, piggybacking on Town of Huntington General Construction Contract and the Town of Huntington Sports Court Requirements Contract to be paid from the assigned unappropriated fund balance. Exhibits B and C available at Village Hall. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. I just want to take a second. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. The basketball courts look dynamite. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for getting that done. Hopefully. And the baseball field is going to be done before June 1st? June, by June 1st. That's great. So hopefully, um, depending on schedules and weather, we can get the temp fence up next week. We will, of course, um, coordinate with Kathy Masterson over at this high school, because I know that's going to take the baseball field away from her. Or the, and then um, we'll get everything else moving. And then the access should all mostly be from the long term right, parking lot. I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you, man. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, and, and then the access should be mo mostly from long term parking. So you think it'll be done by June 1st, as long yeah. as the weather is cooperative? As long as the weather's cooperative. Yeah. You've um, done a great job. Your company is thank terrific. Thank you. Really. I mean, seven weekends in a row where it rains out, that doesn't help yeah, matters. Yeah, But uh, yes, we, we intend to be done by June 1st, right. weather this permitting. This is what they do. This is yeah. exactly what they do. Thank you so, so much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you guys for everything else. Thank previous. you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you, Chris. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Yes. Jerry. Thank you. The rest of the board. Thank you. Uh, 292. Resolution number 292, approve adoption of negative secret declaration regarding the Cove Hollow end of pipe project. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 293, approve the Cove Hollow end of pipe project. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 294, approve enrollment for one police officer in the TEEX basic police motorcycle operator training course, September 16th through September 27th of 2024, a cost of $1,995. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 295, approve employment of David Montenegro as a part-time laborer for the Department of Public Works at $35 hourly, effective May 1st, 2024. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 296, employ John Does Stillwell at $20 an hour and Francine Hanford at $18 an hour, both as 2024 seasonal tour guides at Home Sweet Home, effective May 1st, 2024. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 297, approve employment of Dominic Guida and Minna C. Sharp as part-time hourly employees with the Village's EMTB program at the hourly rate of $28, effective April 23rd of 2024. So moved. Passed and carried. Number 298, approve employment of Nicholas Laval as a full-time police officer at an annual salary of $61,422.31, effective May 1st, 2024. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 299, employ 2024 seasonal traffic control specialists and traffic control officers as listed, effective May 13th, 2024. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 300, approve traffic control specialists Lauren O'Laughlin and Jessica sagbay Ferez for recall assignments at $18 hourly for a maximum of 20 hours per week with a start date of May 1st of 2024. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 301, accept a status change of Michael Rickenback to exempt from the East Hampton Village Ambulance Association. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 302, approve employment of 2024 beach staff as listed to complete preseason work at $20 hourly, effective April 22nd, 2024. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. 
Number 303, accept fire department officers election results for 2024-2025. Chief Engineer Dwayne Forrester, First Assistant Chief Engineer Christopher M. Hatch, Second Assistant Chief Engineer Rory Knight, and Company Officers as listed, effective May 1st, 2024. So moved. Second. Passed and carried, and I just want to thank them for doing an outstanding job. It takes a lot of time and, and a lot of time away from home, so thank them very much. Number 304, approve the East Hampton Fire Department's request for their annual Main Beach Fireworks fundraiser to be held on Saturday, August 10th, 2024, rain date Sunday, August 11th. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 305, notice to bidders for the Northwest Fire Substation overhead door modification to be posted April 25th, 2024, with the bid opening to be held June 4th at 2 p.m. at Village Hall. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 306, deems surplus and approves the sale disposal of lost and found property listed in Acting Chief of Police Jeff Erickson's April 8, 2024 memo. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 307, deems surplus and of no value and approved disposal of one impounded vehicle, 2007 Toyota RAV4, CC number 2, CC 2023-4024. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 308, notice to bidders for a new fence installation at the Emergency Services Building at 1 Cedar Street, available April 22, 2024. Bid opening to be held May 7 at, at 2 o'clock p.m. at Village Hall. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 309, notice to bidders for a two-year Dutch elm disease treatment program with a bid opening to be held May 7, 2024 at 2 p.m. at Village Hall. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 310, notice a public hearing to be held on May 17th, 2024 at 11 a.m. at LTV Studios, 75 Industrial Road, Wainscott, New York, 11975 for introductory number 15 of 2024, a proposed local law authorizing a property tax levy in excess of the limit established in general municipal law, section 3C. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Board scheduled. <laughs> Resolution number 311, notice of public hearing to be held on May 17th, 2024 at 11 a.m. at LTV Studios for introductory number 16 of 2024, a proposed local law amending the code of the Village of East Hampton, Chapter 192, Moratorium on Tennis Court and Pickleball Court Conversions with an extension of six months. So moved. Passed and carried. Number 312, adopt local law, introductory number four of 2024, a proposed local law amending chapter 278 zoning, section 278-1, definitions, non-conforming buildings, and section 278-3, accessory building and structure design requirements and wetland setbacks, and section 278-3A, wetland setbacks. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number three, 13, adopt local law, introductory number three of 2024, a proposed local law amending chapter 163, freshwater wetlands. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 314, adopt local law, introductory number nine of 2024, a proposed local law amending chapter 231, authorizing skip the stuff enforcement for single pla use plastics, restrictions on providing eating utensils, condiment packets, napkins, and extra eating containers. So moved. Passed and carried. Number 315, adopt local law, introductory number 10 of 2024, a proposed local law amending section 2787, Board of Appeals, variances, special permits, fees. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 316, adopt local law, introductory number 11 of 2024, a proposed local law amending chapter 256, article five, partial exemption for members of voluntary fire department and voluntary ambulance service, Section 256.7, exemption granted, amount and eligibility. Section 256.8, life extension of exemption. Section 256.9, application for exemption and adding 256.9, a effective, a, a, a effective date. So moved. Thank you. Passed and carried. Number 317, adopt local law, introductory number 12 of 2024, a proposed local law amending chapter 267.5C4, beach parking permits. Monthly parking permits shall be issued rather than half season parking permits. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. Number 318, approve new volunteer members, Patrick Brabant and Kiefer Mitchell of the Department of Emergency Medical Service. So moved. Second. Passed and carried. 
Resolution number 319, approve the $37,078.98 payout to Susan Stokowski for unused vacation time, accumulated time, and prorated longevity to be paid on May 15th, 2024 from the Employee Benefit Leave Reserve Fund. So moved. Thank you. Passed and carried. Number 320, approve elimination of the position of full-time traffic control specialist effective May 15th, 2024. So moved. Thank you. Passed and carried. Number 321, approve dismissal of traffic control specialist Eric Midget, effective May 15th, 2024. So moved. Thank you. Passed and carried. Number 322, approve designated polling place hours and appointing of four election inspectors for the June 18th, 2024 election. So moved. Thank you. Passed and carried. Number 323, appoint Gabrielle McKay to recording officer for the June 18th, 2024 village election. So moved. Thank you. Passed and carried. Number 324, notice to bidders for wallpaper services at the public meeting room at 1 Cedar Street with the bid specs available on April 22nd, a walkthrough on April 23rd, 2024, and the bid opening to be held May 7th of 2024 at 2 p.m. at Village Hall. So moved. Pass the carry. And resolution number 325 of 2024, notice of public hearing to be held on May 17th. 2024 at 11 a.m. at LTV Studios for introductory number 14, 2024, a proposed local law amending Chapter 176, Historic Areas, Section 17611, Late Night Restaurant Club legislation. So moved. Thank you. Passed and carried. Resolution number 326, 2024, accept bid received from Lance Maroff for C Spray Cottage number one as per January 19th bid specifications. So moved. Thank you. Passed and carried. Is that it? It's everything. All right, so we're going to um, close this meeting and we're going to have executive session back at Village Hall. And if for any reason we need to reopen, we'll, we'll do that. So can I get a motion to close? So moved. Thank you. Okay, meeting is closed. Thank you all for coming.